Hi, so maybe you are thinking of studying the brain, you love computers and making crazy programs, and then you learned about the topic of computational neuroscience. You find it one of the most fascinating topics ever, and after watching many YouTube videos on the subject, you are convinced that yes, this is the subject you want to study. But then the question comes up, is computational neuroscience worth it? And today I want to dive into this question with you by discussing the potential jobs you could get after studying computational neuroscience. And I think something that you have to keep in mind is that when you decide on what to study for your major, there are two main considerations. One, of course, is your future prospects, such as income and job security. And the other one, of course, is passion and how much you actually enjoy studying that subject. And I assume if you clicked on this video, you already have the passion for the subject's computation neuroscience down but you're wondering a lot about job security so today I want to go over eight jobs that I personally know friends of mine that have studied computational neuroscience or fields related to computational neuroscience have gotten and I think if you're still in university and you're doing your undergraduate for example or your bachelor you are probably thinking in a very linear direction at least that's what I did when I thought about what kind of jobs I could get so for example if you studied computational neuroscience you may assume that you for 100% sure have to do something with the brain once you graduate. And this is something that I've seen is not really true. So most people that leave university, they actually end up in jobs that are similar, but not necessarily extremely correlated with computational neuroscience. So I want you to, after this video, kind of broaden your mind for the possible jobs that are out there and really think about the skills that you're learning during computational neuroscience and not necessarily the subjects that you're studying. So the first job I want to talk about is working for a neurotech company. And neurotechnology is this up and coming field or emerging industry at the crossroads between neuroscience and technology, bringing new applications processes, products, services and or businesses models aimed at delivering scalable solutions that benefit people living with neurological diseases, healthcare professionals, researchers and payers. And this is from Biogen. And one of the companies that you may have heard of is from Elon Musk is called Neuralink. And Neuralink has this really vague, if we go to the website, has a very vague definition. It just wants to find breakthrough technology for the brain. So what this exactly mean? I'm not entirely sure, but it is for certain that Elon Musk is just putting a lot of money into brain research or neuroscience because he thinks, right, that this is a field that probably some new breakthroughs will come from. And there are other companies that are following his footsteps. So I also know that Facebook and Amazon is investing more in neuroscience research and computational neuroscience research. But aside from these extremely big companies, there are also a lot of smaller startup companies. So if you look at this list, for example, um, there's this company called Neural, and this is a developing brain computer interfaces that allow people to control software and devices using only their brain activity. And do I think that's already possible? No, probably not. But in the future, this could perhaps be possible, right? That, for example, with a very precise EEG type of system, we could control games or typing. And it is already slightly possible, but this is only true if we implement the device into the brain such that we can directly record electronic electrical activity and right now that's not really ethical so most of these companies are using more extracranial devices and another related field is this digital health and digital health you might have seen already a little bit if you use these kind of health tracker devices so you have for example step counters such as Fitbits or even your Apple health right but there's even companies that take this a step further so they have these implementable devices that really track all your physiological responses. And I think if you studied computational neuroscience, this is also a really interesting field to go into because the data they collect and the data that we collect is very similar. And I think the kind of models we make are also very similar. So the next job that I want to talk about is the most common job that people choose. And that's of course becoming a professor in computational neuroscience. You first have to do a PhD and then a postdoc. Then you pray that you get tenured somehow at a certain point and then you become a professor. But I kind of want to warn you towards this direction if you're not entirely sure if you want to do this. Because amongst PhDs, I think only 3% get in the end a professorship. And something that I want to caution with this is that this 3% is not from the top universities. So most people, when they think about 
that they want to become a professor. They think about that they want to become a professor at Harvard or Yale and not a professor at a very small local university. But the chances that you become a professor at Harvard or Yale are even more slim than the chances of you becoming a professor at a small local university. So I think the road towards professorship is just very hard and I've known people that are amazing researchers and they're still not considered for tenure. So I will link to this article that gives a perspective of how to become a professor from a European perspective. So another field that you might consider is biotech companies and biotech is very similar to neuro tech but more on the pharmaceutical side as well as the biological side so usually people that i know with a more practical application computational neuroscience perspective go towards those fields so for example if you know how to do animal research this could be a very good fit for you because you could be in the forefront of developing new covid vaccinations for example so these kind of companies usually ask for really practical skills or very well-defined modeling skills and i think if you have one of these two this could be a very good fit for you. Then another job you might consider is scientific journalist. So I think scientific journalism or scientific outreach is usually not something people consider when they start a graduate school, for example. But I think it's a field that's really interesting and really fun if you're good at writing. So some of the skills, of course, they ask for is writing and clear communication. You can think of scientific journalist positions for papers. So for example, in Nature, they ask for a scientific journalist or even a scientific editor. But you can also think of as becoming a scientific journalist for a paper like the New York Times or other these type of related fields and the, and the way you would then structure how you would write an article of course depends on the type of magazine you would write for and something that I also find very interesting is that also for books that are getting published they usually also want a scientific researcher that helps with the research for a book so if you think for example like a book like this like biased so usually you have the main author that writes the book but they also usually have an extra scientific journalist or a scientific person that helps with the research for these kind of books and fact checks all the statements that are made. And you can also consider a job like that if you really love reading books or reading articles. Another field that's really related to neuroscience that almost no one considers is actually computational finance. So if you're into dynamical modeling and, dyna and dynamical systems that are used a lot in neuroscience, actually the same type of models are also used a lot in finance. So for example, if we look at the computational projects that are listed here from the UVA, we see this project data-driven models for risk management in trading activities. And actually the type of dynamical systems they used are very similar to the ones I've used in computational neuroscience for predicting individual neural responses or a group of neural responses. They usually use the information from one time point or a few time points in the past to predict future events. And the same type of modeling is applied in computational finance. And another really big upcoming field in computational neuroscience is network causality, which is partly made by Judea Pearl, or he really pushed this field forward. Network causality is also something that's highly used in computational finance. So that's really trying to predict how the market responds from one cause and not necessarily from correlation. So this kind of goes a little bit further than correlation. And I think that's also a really interesting field to go towards if you also want to just earn a little bit more money than other fields that I've mentioned before. Another position that you can really consider is to become a permanent scientist. So permanent scientists are usually jobs that are not really profiled that much on if you look for jobs within university. There are actually a lot of permanent scientist staff at university that we just don't really um, hear that much about. But a permanent staff scientists are usually called research scientists, investigators and or specialists and staff scientists can be responsible for managing labs such as lab managers or lab directors, facilities or specific equipment. And I now also know a lot of people that are a staff scientist for the computational part of things because usually a lot of professors are not necessarily trained to do high complex computational modeling. So I know a lot of bigger universities now have 
a department or a small team that helps with managing these computational tasks and helps with these type of questions. And also, for example, if you're very good at statistics, a lot of bigger labs also hire statisticians to help with the statistical analysis of certain protocols. So I think usually these type of jobs are not really listed but if you have a highly developed skill set and you don't really want to become a professor but you do want to stay at university it's good to for example email a few people that you know at that university to ask if there's a position that's available to you that's not necessarily becoming a professor. Another type of position you can really consider is to become a researcher at an independent institute. So throughout the world there are multiple independent institutes and independent meaning independent from the government, from universities and or other organizations. And these type of institutes usually have very broad research interests and you have a lot of freedom as a scientist to propose and do new research. So one that I really know in the Netherlands is TNO. And TNO does a lot of research in all type of STEM fields, subjects, and the only thing they require is that you did a master and or PhD in a STEM field subject. So you can even do, if you come from neuroscience, you can even do research on quantum science if you find that interesting because they have this kind of philosophy that if you're trained in these fields that you should be able to put your knowledge at different topics as well and that this type of knowledge transfer is actually more important for making the field go forward than having the super specific background for a super specific topic. And other institutes that I know of are the Allen Institute, for example, in Seattle, they're more focused on neuroscience or you can think of the NIH. And there, I think in every country, there are usually a few of these independent research institutes. So just look up in your country or your capital research institute, blah, 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 blah. And then usually you will find some positions and or projects that perhaps interest you. Sure. And the last type of job that you can consider is to work for a startup company. So I think if you work for a startup company, the type of skills you need are way more diverse because usually in startup companies, they don't have that much money to hire a lot of people. But the thing that I like about it is that you usually get to learn a lot more at a startup company than at a bigger, bigger company. Because for example, if you are hired at a startup company as the computational person, then usually they also maybe want you to make a website at a certain point or do some kind of outreach, or maybe they will send you to a conference. And I think this diversity of skills that you need at startup companies really allow you to expand your horizon of what is possible with a different type of degree. So I would definitely advise you to also look at these type of startup companies if you're searching for a job after your computational neuroscience degree. And these are all the fields and or positions that I have heard of. If you know another position or someone that has done something like computational neuroscience and I haven't listed it, please put it down in the comments below because I always love to hear what people did or do after their computational neuroscience degree. And otherwise, see you next week. Bye!